couple of bits of uh, intro. So I've been birding for nearly six six decades. I kicked off when I was six or seven, uh, and I've born and raised in Hampshire. I'm a Winchester man, uh, so this has been this part of the area has been my stamping ground. So many happy hours in the New Forest and Pennington and, and Key Haven and so on and so forth. Uh, after that, I've moved around, but I've moved back about five years ago. So I, I live in the New Forest now. Uh, speaking of that, a little bit of news for you on the birding front. Um, some of you may have heard of the ferruginous duck down at uh, uh, Blashford. Uh, well, it's on Kingfisher Lake. Uh, just off Hurst Road, uh, and I saw it yesterday, but the limited is limited uh, viewing conditions. So I actually took along a step ladder so I could peer over the fence yesterday, which uh, uh, made life things. Um, I've got to say a couple of thank yous. First of all, to Nicola Whitmarsh for getting this all together and getting the um, invites out. To Barry for being the uh, immaculate MC that he is. Uh, and last but not least to Keith Betton, uh, whose advice and encouragement I, I valued in getting this talk together. So without further ado, uh, let's go for bird identification in 12 steps. Now, this is inspired by a very good book uh, by a chap called Steve Howell and Brian Sull Sull Sullivan. And, and I've got a copy here. Uh, the one slight problem with this book is it's in American. Uh, and Steve and Brian are very good American ornithologists. And on the basis of that, I've sort of anglified it for us all or anglicized whatever the word is. So uh, let's move along. Right, here we go. Now, burning ID in 12 steps. Um, how do I tackle that? And I thought perhaps a silly phrase using some birding terms to remember them by might help. So I'm gonna bring up the 12 steps now, and then I'm gonna bring up the little phrase to help you uh, uh, try and remember them. Uh, and as you can see at the bottom, we're gonna have a picture of a bird and a quiz question in a minute, which should make life a little more interesting. So here are the 12 steps. And uh, I'm just gonna move that around across to my other side of my screen. And you can see all the pretty colors there, and they are, sensible and what they do is they form a framework for you to hang your knowledge that you have at the moment on to take you through a number of processes in order to get to the id of a bird so we start at the top with taxonomy that's all about families and groups and species uh, location is where you are in the world habitat is what sort of place you're in seasons are when you are there uh, and then two linked topics, uh, lighting and distance can make a huge difference to how you see and perceive a bird. Uh, then we come on to behavior and sound. And when we get to sound, that's number eight and we'll stop, but that will tee us up for the next section tomorrow night, which are about structure, plumage, variation and notes. Um, now here's that silly little phrase, which I've tried to put in some birding terms, some of which you may be familiar with and some perhaps not. So the lazy, we can do that and we can do Hampshire. What's a stringer though? Um, there's a very good book from a long time ago by Bill Oddie called His Little Black Bird Book. And it introduces all sorts of terms about birding and stringing is one of them. And, and stringing is a rather rude term for somebody who tries to turn common birds into rarer birds. So if you hear a record from somebody like that, they can be said to be a bit of a stringer and some of their records are stringy. So that, that's what a string is about. And now we come on to loves and dude. What's a dude? Now, many of you are probably much better at getting up in the morning than I am. And you'll be out there at first light and, and uh, you know, seeing all the birds and what have you. Um, if you're not and you roll up at sort of 11 o'clock in the morning and maybe you'll, you know, had the morning coffee, maybe a little nip of something to get you going, then you probably arrived and missed all the good birds because they happened between six and 11 in the morning. So it's somebody who has a very relaxed attitude to their birding, a bit, a bit dudish, you know, swans in, misses everything, swans out again. 
birding, you know about birding, scanning, you can do that, putting up your bins, stupidly, that was just a word that fitted in with the fraid, and then pishing. Now, if you don't know what pishing is about, um, some of you may have been able to go to the Americas, um, and it seems that there you can call birds out of bushes um, by pishing, believe it or not. And this covers a whole range of sounds that you, the observer, make to try and tempt somebody, uh, some bird to come out of the bush and see you. So you might be sort of doing psh, psh, or, or whatever it might be. Um, and here on our side of the pond, they can respond, but not as well as they do in the States. And maybe somebody has surmised that that could be to do with the fact that in the old world, birds and animals have had far more exposure to mankind as we've grown up through Neanderthals and all the rest of it, um, than they have perhaps in the States. So they're slightly less wary and it does seem to work very well over here. Although I did, when I was in the New Forest the other day, manage to pish a Dartford warbler because they are quite curious. They can be difficult to see, but it worked at that point. So taxonomy through to notes. I'm moving my mouse pointer. I hope you can see that. And then the lazy Hampshire stringer loves dude birding, scanning stupidly, pishing very noisily. And each of these letters, as you can see, I've picked them out in red, will fit with the initial letter of the step. Okay, I promised you a picture of a bird. So let's go to that. And hopefully you'll all know what this is. But how did you know? And we'll sort that out as we go through these 12 steps. Here it is. So you'll recognize that. And in fact, I've got my I've got my T-shirt on tonight. I hope you can see that, my, my Hampshire sweatshirt. Um, of course, it is our symbol, a hoss symbol, the kingfisher. Uh, and you'll see that it's got a fish in its bill, so that's helpful. It's in water and it's got these fantastic colors that we all know and love. Um, and we're going to use the 12 steps to help us ID it. But here's a quiz question for you. Any idea which sex this is? Is this a male or is it a female? You can tell if you know where to look. Uh, and in fact, it's a male because it's got a dark, I'm just putting my mouse on the lower mandible, and this bottom section here, sort of the proximal half as it's known, uh, is all black. Uh, and ladies in the breeding season will show, excuse me, a reddish orange bill base during the breeding season. So, that's the first bit of ID and we'll fit these nuggets of information into the framework as we go through, as you will see. <clears throat> so here are some thoughts for to guiding you through this, the, these steps. Um, you already know a lot about birds, whether you realize it or not. And what I hope to do with these 12 steps is it begins with the basics and then builds into a systematic framework where you can sort and place what you know. And then you'll be able to see that you have gaps or you know a lot there uh, and you'll be able to fit things together perhaps in a more logical way than we have done in the past. The great thing, great thing about our hobby, uh, well, I call it a passion, um, is that you can enjoy it at so many different levels. Uh, you can know what you know and just enjoy your garden birds or you can be out there and just look at gulls or you can travel further afield. And we've heard talks from people like Keith Betton, who uh, travels quite extensively. Um, and I've managed one or two of those as well. So there's always something new to learn about birds and birding. And, and I hope that maybe I tell you a few things that you didn't know tonight, but there's always something to learn. And in, and in fact, it never ceases to amaze me about the depth of interest that birds can provide. There's, there's always so much more I don't know than what I do know. So it, 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 it constantly gives as you, as you increase your knowledge. So I hope there's something for everyone here tonight. And even if you learn just one new fact about bird ID, one new snippet, it will have all have been worthwhile. Okay, so let's start with taxonomy. What's that all about? 
what does this word mean? So it works on the principle of relatedness and it's, it's a fancy word for organizing and naming birds. Let's have a look at the taxonomy of the common kingfish. And I'm just gonna have a sip if you don't mind. <clears throat> Thank you. So here's our kingfisher. And again, I can say you should know now this is a male because of the black proximal half of the lower mandible. And this is the scientific classification for a kingfisher. So in the scientists have, have, have created these domains. So there's the very ancient stuff which existed way back at the beginning of Earth. And then you come down to the, the, the most common domain, which is eukaryota. And in that, that this covers plants and animals. Uh, so a kingfisher is an animal uh, and its phylum is chordata. And what does chordata mean? It means it's got a backbone. Okay, uh, but there are other things like the insects uh, and the other invertebrates that don't have backbones. Uh, it's ave, so it's birds, and it's caraceiformes, and that means things like rollers and bee eaters and kingfishers. And then you come to the main kingfisher family, which is alcadinidae, with its subfamily alcadininae. And then we get down to genus, and I'll come and talk about those in a minute. So you've got alcado. And this bird, what absolutely defines this bird is Alcidoathis. No other species on earth has Alcidoathis. So the scientific names are unique. And some of you would say, oh, but, but sometimes aren't there subspecies names? And we'll come on to that a bit later on. So at the higher level, among the families, which is we're here, uh, we've got a family. And within a family, there are genera, um, or which is the plural of genus. And families basically group genera together and genera group species together. Then you come to the middle level where within families, you've got birds that share characteristics. So curlews, godwits, and stints are all sandpipers but belong to different genera. And, and when you look in your field guides, you will have the English name, the vernacular name, and you will have the scientific or the Latin name as well. So curlews and Aminius, godwits are limosa and stints are calidris. Um, so that's a broad grouping. A family is a broad group of birds, but who all share characteristics. So you will know that curlews, godwits and stints are all waders and they're all sandpipers. Within a genus, they're more closely related. So chaffinch and brambling are in the genus Fringilla. So they're very closely related. Uh, and then you get down to the bottom, which we've just done with the kingfisher, and the species is the basic block of birding. Now I've got a couple of other snippets to toss in here, um, is that this ordering of families, and that's what taxonomy does, has moved around. Uh, it, it, it used to be set in stone pretty much up to the 1950s and with a, a few jiggles around, stayed that way until the 1990s. And then DNA made its appearance and genetic sequencing has enabled all sorts of changes to be made where such things which weren't thought to be related to each other are and others that were thought to be related are not. Um, so that is also shown in things like field guides and some of the older field guides uh, will have different birds at the start of the order than say the normal Collins guide uh, and I'll refer to this one a bit more in a minute. So back to species, a species is the basic block of birding but, but what is it? What is a species? <clears throat> now I've got another fine book coming up uh, which I'll show you the front cover of. And this has only just been published. It's by Lynx Editions, which is a Spanish outfit run by Josep del Hoyo. Uh, and they recently published the Handbook of Birds of the World. And this amazing book compares and contrasts the presently accepted four taxonomic orders for family, genera, and species. Uh, and they're trying now 
There is a working group now to establish a single list for all of the birds of the world. Uh, and some of you may remember Keith Betton's talk on the basics of birding, where it's currently reckoned there are about 11,000 species of bird in the world. In fact, this book, because there are nips and tucks between the various taxonomic orders, lists about 11,600. And, and, and here's the book I'm talking about. Now, this magnificent beast is what used to be called uh, the monkey eating eagle. I think it's been called Philippine eagle after they've done some rationalizations, but it really does eat monkeys. Uh, and here's a plate <clears throat> to show you. And there are two birds uh, that we can find in Britain. One is on the British list and it's snowy owl up here in the top left. Uh, and then there's a Eurasian eagle owl. Now, eagle owl occupies an interesting position in that it's not yet on the British list, but it has bred in this country. And I suspect it's going, it could well follow in the steps of Goshawk where with immigrant birds from the continent and falconers birds that I have escaped or been released, Goshawk has now formed a stable population. And in fact, they're on my garden list here in the new forest. Um, I don't see them very often, but I do see them, you know, once a month or so uh, in and around where I live. And Eagle Owl is probably going to follow um, in those footsteps, but it's probably going to take a decade or so before there are sufficient uh, birds that have gone feral and, and have built up a breeding population. <clears throat> so a bit more on taxonomy. Ornithology and birding are full of debates about what is a species. Um, and taxonomists will be going to be grappling with families and genera and species. And I you see I put it in quotes for years to come. Um, it can be rather subjective. Uh, it can be a bit like you say either, I say either, you say tomato, I say potato. Um, and that book I've just shown you manages to trap all of the current statuses of what people think birds are. For instance, did you know? Maybe not. Maybe this is your one fact for the evening. Many people now view falcons, such as peregrines, believe it or not, as closer to parrots than they are to Akipitas, broadwing hawks, such as sparrowhawks. Now, when I were a lad, they were all raptors and all of them were birds of prey. Well, as far as I'm concerned, they still all are birds of prey, but I accept and understand that DNA has been able to show the lineages and the divergences between birds of prey so that peregrines and falcons uh, aren't as closely related to sparrowhawks and the other birds of prey. Two words in red here, splitting and lumping. When people and taxonomists in particular decide that one species is in fact two or even three, as we shall see later on, uh, they decide to split it. So they, you may have had, this is an X and it had a couple of subspecies, but now they are su su sufficiently different that they don't breed together or very much, they call differently and they're in different parts. Lumping is the reverse of that, where actually people thought there were two species and there's now one, and one has become a subspecies of the other. So for your birding, it is helpful to have a good idea of current taxonomy. Uh, there's a lot to get your head around, and taxonomy basically tells you the, the, the time order in which birds evolved with the oldest first and the latest last. And this is even more true if you start to understand the earliest birds. Now, the, the front birds at the beginning of the current taxonomy, believe it or not, are the ratites. And what are ratites? They're things like ostriches, rheas, emus, uh, and cassowaries. And you take a cassowary's leg and look at the bones and you take a dinosaur's leg and you look at the bones and the two are virtually identical. And this was further proof to the theory that in fact birds are dinosaurs. So taxonomy is a very live science, it's changing all the time, but there is a reasonably stable order which does appear in things like the Collins Guide. Okay, so where they are in the book is a help for you placing the bird and identifying it. So on that basis, if you can say, I saw a gull 
or a duck, which is at the families, or dropping down a level, you can say, ah, I've got a warbler, but I think it's a Sylvia warbler, or no, actually it could be a Locustella, then that's taxonomy at work and you're halfway to nailing the ID. If, for instance, you can say, I know it was a gull, then that excludes it being a duck. And similarly, if you've seen a Locustella warbler, which to you and me uh, includes grasshopper, Sylvia warblers include things like blackcaps, uh, then this process of elimination, this systematic cutting down on the possibilities is all about how taxonomy works and how 12 steps works in terms of nailing the ID. So splitting and lumping, I'm gonna speed up a little bit here. Chiff chaff and Iberian chiff chaff. Uh, they used to be thought of as separate. Uh, this one, the, the Iberian over here is in Spain. This one's all over Europe and Siberia, uh, but they call distinctly differently and very rarely interbreed. Lumping, what have we got here? The two shrikes, great gray and step gray. Uh, the sequencing of the DNA shows in fact that step gray on the right here is a subspecies of great gray. They used to be thought of as two, two species, but now it's one. More and final bits on taxonomy. Uh, I think Keith talked about non-passerines and passerines. Here are the non-passerines and they got your ostrich down here and here are the passerines. So passerines are perching birds, but it's a useful distinction to be aware of. You may not use it very often. Um, and so you've got everything in here from flamingos to ostriches, up to woodpeckers, over to macaws, albatrosses, all of the perching birds. You'll see some familiar ones here. Here's a pied wagtail at the top. There's a cardinal, which is an American, a pied flycatcher, a long-tailed tit. And all of those fit into this tree. Uh, now the middle columns here, um, I'm sorry for those of you who've got small screens, you may not be able to see this, but these are some of the accepted orders of birds. And from ostriches at the bottom all the way up to parrots, those are the non-passerines. And the passerines appear latest of all and have diversified the most. Okay, now I've got a couple more tricks to throw in here. I'm actually going to put a couple of hours, arrows here that I'm bouncing. Here, here's a harpy eagle, and that's along with the hawks, eagles, and secretary bird. Uh, here's the secretary bird, an osprey. Uh, and then here are the falcons, and I'm bouncing in. So here's a peregrine, and here's a macaw, and you can see the parrots and falcons at the top right, if you can see that on your screen, are right next door to her. And so they diverged. I'm putting my mouse pointer over this brown marker and the orange marker here. And you can see they came up the tree, the hawks and falcons moved right. Sorry, let me just go back one, apologies. And the falcons and the parrots moved left. So that was quite a lot on taxonomy, but it is important because it tells you about the speciation of birds and how they've evolved over time. And these lines here, tell you how the things evolved and how they've split over the years into the various families and genesis. Okay, let's draw breath. So now we're into step two, which is lazy. And these next sections go in blocks that help you. And it's probably the thing that you meet first of all when you're out in the field. So location, uh, location is key. And with habitat and season, which are three and four, it forms, it forms the big three. So you know where you are in the world, which then will dictate the sort of birds. So if you're in South America, uh, you will see things like condors, uh, but you won't see condors here. By the same token, uh, if you're in the UK, uh, you can see birds that you won't see in South America. And a good field guide helps you to ID your birds. And you should have a field guide. Uh, lots of people use this one, uh, and I've waved it in front of you before. It, in, in it is a fantastic book. Um, and it may be overwhelming at first. Uh, there's a lot in here. But as you build your knowledge, 
you will be able to use this and you will become more familiar with the birds that are in there. Despite that some things all look rather bewildering at first, start with the basics, get a few uh, commoner ones in place, and then you'll be able to say, ah, oh, I know that's a common one uh, and it's not that. It's got three components. So it's got illustrations and pictures, descriptions and texts, and most importantly, distribution maps. And maps tell you where the birds are and where they are not. And most species have well-defined and well-documented distributions. And let's look at a couple of things that are relevant to Hampshire. So birds by location, here's a capercaillie. You will not find it in Hampshire today. It's only in Northern Scotland. Uh, and if you want to go and see a capercaillie, and this is a cock, uh, you have got to go up to Speyside and what have you. However, however, back in 1886 and 1887, somebody did try to introduce capercaillie to the new forest. Uh, and I have this on the authority of Kelsel and Munn, which is the first effectively Birds of Hampshire book. By the same token, some of you may have seen this. And this is the Wilson's phalarope that was found at Pennington in October 2020. But it shouldn't be here because it's an American species. So knowing where you are, so you will only find Capercaillie in old Scots pine forests. And this one you will find out at sea and in marshes as we did at Pennington. So where birds are and where you are tells you a lot about the sorts of birds that you might see. Habitat. So what, where are you and what are you in? Um, that also gives a strong indication about the sorts of birds that you want to see. And, and just going back to location for a moment, if you want to see Dartford Warbler and Firecrest, Hampshire is one of the best counties in the whole of the UK to see them. So I've got some birds up here uh, and hopefully you will know what they are. I will tell you what they are in a moment. But here's some indications of habitat. So green woodpeckers do need trees. They peck wood. Dartford warblers, need gorse, kingfishers need water, and dotterels need mountains. Now, we don't have too many mountains in Hampshire, but you can see dotterel on passage here as they fly down from the Cairngorms, which is their mountains. But what I'm trying to drive at here is that overall, where you are and the habitat does have a great bearing on what sorts of birds you might be able to see, uh, but not always. Be a bit wary here. I've got a bird flying over the sea here, and I'll just let you have a look at that, and you can ponder while I have a sip of water. <clears throat> Believe it or not, this is a female nightjar on migration over the sea. But if you saw that from a boat, you'd think, what the hell is that? So just, just beware, birds do get themselves out of place and out of time on occasions. Season, when, 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 when. Season can tell you a lot about and help you narrow down the possibilities for your bird. So it's the last of the big three. As you can see here, it's the where, what, when. Where are you, what, it, what are you in, and when are you there? Uh, so at right, we've got a couple of summer breeders two resident birds and a winter migrant. Here are the summer breeders, which are usually only with us in the summer. Swallows at the top here go all the way to South Africa and in between for the winter, as you well know. This is a male because it's actually got long tail streamers, but that's a finer point. And these boys, the most gorgeous birds, the puffins, only come ashore to breed. So you've got to go to places like Skoma, Skokum, Pembrokeshire coast, and other uh, off sea islands to see puffins breeding. And if you do have the chance to go, go up to the Farne Islands or Skoma, it's a fantastic experience. For the rest of the year, these tiddlers, believe it or not, are out in the broad ocean, right out in the pelagic. And they spend eight months of the year at sea before coming home to breed. Next to, yeah, we all love a robin and here's a nuthatch doing its thing. Uh, and these are with us all year round. In fact, I saw both in my garden today. And lastly, a winter migrant, which I also saw in my garden today. This is a red wing, uh, obviously with the marks under the wing. <clears throat> so 
The swallow and puffin are summer breeders, nuthatch and robin are residents, and the red winged is in winter. So if somebody says to you, oh, guess what? I had a red wing in my garden in July. The answer is you didn't, or it would be incredibly unlikely. Uh, and if you saw a puffin in your garden in the middle of winter, it's just about feasible. Occasionally they have been wrecked in really severe winter storms, but it, you would know that something was wrong in that case. So when you see a bird and what time of year you're seeing it in is a very good pointer towards its uh, identification. Lighting, oh, lighting, yeah, okay. Lighting can change the way that we, as, as we watch a bird and affects what we perceive. It's inherently important as to how we see it. And the more experience you gain, <clears throat> the more you will uh, learn to allow for lighting uh, in any situation, in any ID issue. Now, this is a sooty shearwater. Uh, and its characteristic is it's got these pale wing linings. Now this bird on the left here that I'm pointing to was taken in full sunlight and very strong sunlight has the effect of bleaching out the bird. So it's paler all over the wings, the underwings are reflecting more. Uh, and here's another one taken in dull light, which is a far better representation of what a sooty shearwater actually looks like. It's a browner, darker bird. The wing linings are, not, are still visible at long range. Uh, but they are not as prominent as they would appear to be on this incredibly well-lit individual. So light can make a huge difference. And, and here's another pair. These are herring gulls. But look at the mantle color here. Much, much darker on the left than this well-lit one on the right. And there are people who love, and perfectly reasonably so, love to look at gulls and nothing else. And some people are so adamant and, 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 and perfectionists on this, that they will only go out on dull days, which is when this way photograph was taken on the left here, so they can appreciate the subtleties of the shades of gray. So um, uh, at the risk of being a little, you know, there are many shades of gray in herring gulls and indeed gulls in general. Uh, and of course, ravens are black, aren't they? Are they? Look at this one on the right here where the light is catching its feathers. It looks pretty silvery to me. And all crows exhibit this when they turn and catch the sunlight on their wings. It, it can be quite extraordinary how silvery they can look. Only instantaneously as they turn and bank and catch some things. So please be in no doubt, light can fool you big time. So please be aware of how much it can vary what you see. And as you gain more experience, you will learn to say, ah, I saw one of those and the last time it was X and it did Y. Distance, distance, distance. So distance, as I put here, is the great deceiver and imagination is the great receiver. You have to ask, what am I really seeing? Really question what you're looking at and be certain of what you're doing. So here's an example. This is a white stalk. It's flying. And you can see all the ID marks, nice red legs, long ones, a white tail, a red long pointy bill, quite a long neck, and these beautiful black primary, secondaries and tertials, and then these white coverts on the upper wing. But look right, these are also stalks and each of them is identifiable. So these are thermally high up, probably in migration, you might have see some of these if you go towards the eastern end of the Mediterranean, if you've holidayed in Turkey or, or maybe Israel at the right time, and they migrate in their thousands. But most of the time that you see a red stalk, a red stalk, sorry, a white stalk, they're high up. Um, now, recently we had one in Hampshire down at Harbridge, uh, and I was lucky enough to see this bird and I saw it at low level, and then it started to climb and climb and climb and climb until it was about probably 2000 feet up and going away from us at about a mile distant, but it was still identifiable as a white stalk. Here's a gold crest close up. And here's a very small gold crest at a hundred yards. It's just a blob. 
So the other thing you need to learn about distance is you can identify some species confidently at some distance or other, but not at all distances. And if a bird's too far away, you might just have to let it go and say, you know what, it's a hoodwink uh, and look for something closer to hand to watch. They can just be annoying and get away from you. Uh, that happens to me quite a lot where you think, I just didn't quite get enough on that, but never mind, there'll be another day. And I've got a couple of tricks for you here to help you understand and identify birds at distance. And again, it's about building your experience. So I'm going to talk about the buzzard trick now. And the buzzard trick says you find a buzzard in your bins when it's quite close by. You're driving along a country lane or you're walking and you pick one up in a field or it's flying over a hedgerow quite close by, 50, 100 yards. Correctly identified as a buzzard, uh, but it's a reasonably sunny day and, and it starts to catch a thermal and it goes up and starts to climb and then it's going away from you and it's circling. Stick with it because as it climbs and it goes away from you, it will get smaller and smaller, but you know it's still a buzzard. And that appreciation of how the bird changes. So what will happen is you won't see, you know, the patterning on the underside of the wings. They'll start to block out and they'll become a monocolor, as will the top of the wing when it circles and comes around, as will the tail. But that's fine because you're building your appreciation of what the bird looks like at different distances. And there's another trick you can use, which is the robin trick. And you can do this in your own back garden. So I always have a, a pair of binoculars on my, my kitchen table because I never know quite what's going to fly past. Uh, and I did this the other day and it, was, it, it really is effective. So I picked up this robin and looked at it through my bins. Uh, and then what I did is I knew it was a robin and I put my bins down and just looked at it with my naked eye. And then I watched how it moved and how its colors changed and the way it behaved and what have you. And I can now tell a robin at the bottom of my garden without even picking my bins up. Now it's taken a bit of time, but these aspects, these way that birds move are really good practice and will really help you with ID. So the buzzard trick is about staying with the bird until it gets distance. And the robin trick, robin trick is about using your bins, but also using your eyes and just looking at stuff with the naked eye. And now we come on to behavior. What the hell is behavior? Well, some birds do things which are unique to them. Here's a pair of birds. I'm sure you can all identify them. Now, pheasants don't do what the swifts do and swifts don't do what the pheasant do. Okay, so you won't find a swift running around in the grass, pecking up and eating worms. Similarly, you won't find a pheasant soaring away at, a, at 500 feet taking insects out of the air. They're mutually exclusive. So you can say to yourself, aha, I know that's not a swift running around in the field because it's not acting like a pheasant. So swifts don't run around on the grass and pheasants don't scythe the air overhead. So how birds behave gives clues to their identity. And we'll see more of that tomorrow night. So watch what it's doing. And you can observe a lot by watching. And behavior is often visible at greater distance than conventional field marks. So let's do this one. Here we are. You're out. You may be down at Titchfield Haven or you're at Pennington, Key Haven uh, or somewhere up the Solent. And you see a small wader. Ah, a wader. That's taxonomy for you. You've identified it to a family. That's good. So this is a sandpiper. And it's a bit distant, but you can get it in your bins, but it then starts to move and it bobs its tail frequently. And it then says, all right, well, I need to move further up. And it takes off and it flies with bursts of shallow, stiff wing beats, low over the water. All of those things, the size, the stiff, shallow wing beats, the bobbing of the tail, point towards common sandpiper, which indeed I'm sure a lot of you will have been able to identify from this shot. Um, and then you spy a small, a, for, a 
podcast, <laughs> sorry, you spy a small falcon, got the words out, in the distance that's flying along and then suddenly it comes up to the hover for a long time, moving its tail constantly to hold position. And it's almost certainly this. Now, this is a male kestrel and other birds of prey can occasionally hover. So buzzers, if they've got a good stiff wind coming into their position, will rather labouredly hover and what have you. But kestrels do it habitually. Sparrowhawks don't. So this is another piece of behavioural knowledge which will help you pinpoint the ID. And in fact, if you watch a kestrel closely, you will see that the head, the rest of the body is moving, the wings, the tail, the body, the head stays stock still. And it's an extraordinary feat. They, uh, you know, these are, dare I say it, more accurate than a helicopter in terms of maintaining their position in the air. So a bit more on behavior. Some birds have unique behaviors that can pretty much identify them as a specific species. Uh, and this, all of this behavior and other things add to this jizz, this uniqueness of particular birds. So oh, here we are, and they're gonna come up, <clears throat> and I'll just let you look at them for a bit while I have a, another glug of water. And I'll let you see if you can identify them. Now, each of them is doing something which is unique to it and is a real pointer to its identity. So one's flicking its wings, and that's this boy. One's plunge diving, another's running down a tree, and one's stooping. Doing the robin trick, if I'm looking, I'm hovering my mouse over this one. Uh, if I see this at the bottom of the garden and it's wing flicking, I know exactly what it is. Uh, it's not a robin, it's not a sparrow. It is in fact a dunnock. Uh, and then maybe I'm down at Hurst Spit or maybe a little further up the coast towards New Milton. And I catch sight of a large bird off through my binoculars or maybe my telescope off the end of the, uh, the Isle of Wight. And suddenly it jinks and turns and dives straight into the water. Now, size and colour, but also that behaviour, make this a gannet. I'm in the forest or maybe down at Blashford Lakes and there's a bird running down a tree. It's likely to be a nuthatch, okay? Some birds run up trees like tree creepers and woodpeckers, but very few run down. Nuthatches can run. And the last one, is one that's stooping. Now, this may be hard to recognize, but in fact, it's, a, it's the fastest animal in the world. This is a peregrine falcon hitting possibly 200 miles per hour in its stoop as it moves in on a, on a prey item. So they are answers and well done if you got them all, okay? And lastly, for this session, we come to probably one of the most important items on bird identification, which is sound. Be that songs, be it calls, be it contact notes, sound is a vitally, I cannot stress that enough, vitally important in bird ID. And more often than not, you will hear birds way before you see them and your, their calling will lead you to find them and be able to see them. And knowing and recognizing their calls and songs is huge. Birding becomes so much simpler when you know the call. Now, I do not underestimate how difficult people find this, and you will all find it difficult, but it's a bit like building blocks and Lego. You start simple and build up. I know that's a robin calling. I know it's a dunnock, a blackbird, a great tit, a blue tit, and you get the basics in place. And again, this aspect of elimination comes in. So. I know that wasn't a, it was a tit, but it wasn't a great tit or a blue tit because it wasn't calling like either of those. What could it be? Well, you know, you've got cold tit, long tit, uh, long tail tit and, and others to choose from within the tit family. So what I'm gonna do now <clears throat> is I'm gonna play a few calls uh, and I will comment on them as we go through. And here's the first one. <clears throat> Thank you. 
Now, that sound clip started off with, in fact, a pretty rare bird in Hampshire. In fact, rare generally, it was a turtle dove. And the one, but the one I wanted you to listen to was the really noisy one, which was the wren, uh, which in terms of decibels per inch of bird has to be up at the top in terms of the amount of sound that it produces. Now, there were a couple of other things. There was a rook uh, and, and there may have been a bit of a black cap stuck in the background, but that's what happens when you go out recording birds. Hopefully this next one, everybody will get. Yep. Now that cuckoo had in the background chiff chaff and I think there was also a rook quietly in the background and that tells you immediately without any question that you're listening to a cuckoo. Cuckoo is the only member of the cuckoo family that we get in this country so you know that it's a cuckoo. Maybe some of you haven't seen a cuckoo yet but listening uh, for those and then perhaps moving towards where the bird is calling you may be lucky enough to spot one. Now, the next one is a real treat. Uh, and it's, it's a long, it's about a minute. Uh, sorry, no, it's about 30 seconds, but it's really worth listening to because it is recognized as one of the most astonishing songsters that we've got. No, oh. <laughs> I'm sorry, I've just pressed the wrong clip. Hang on, let me pause that one. Here's the one I meant to play. Okay, I think that's it, hopefully. Not quite. If you hear one of those in Hampshire, pat yourself on the back. Uh, and if you've been to Berkeley Square in London, you won't ever hear a nightingale uh, in Berkeley Square, but you can just occasionally hear them in Hampshire, but it, it's such a beautiful call and, and, and so evocative. Uh, this one, the next one, you will hear in Hampshire, in fact, I heard one the other day when I was at Pennington, uh, and it readily identifies the bird. Oh, sorry. My mouse is moving around out of my control. I do apologize. Let's try this one. Oh, wait a minute. Sorry. There we are. that that's a wimbrel and here's the next one and my old dad would always call that a yaffle uh, because of its call uh, and of course you may well be able to recognize it as a green woodpecker uh, this next one is in fact has got a place in British history uh, because Hampshire was the first place where one of these was ever seen in the whole of the UK. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. I do not know what's going on. Right, let's try again. Now, the first of these was found by a gentleman called Dr. Suffren, 
whom I met when I was uh, a wee lad, uh, and it's a Chetty's warbler. And from that early invasion, because they self seeded themselves in this country, uh, they have spread pretty much everywhere where you've got suitable vegetation, which is sort of uh, moist uh, ditches with scrub and, and what have you. With some birds, you get some things that look very much alike, but call differently. And the next pair, uh, I hope if this, I do apologize, my mouse is playing up. And then you have a bird that calls. Like this, which looks very similar, but is completely different. So if you see those last two, uh, they do look very similar. And the first one was a willow warbler and the second one was a chiff chaff. Uh, interesting, uh, it's got an onoma onomatopoeic name. So it's call describes the name and the name describes the call. So chiff chaff, chiff chaff, chiff chiff chaff. Uh, you see those together and they don't call. It is possible to tell them apart, but you need to look very closely. Uh, but if they call, it's a cinch, it really is. So, right, right. So birds communicate with each other all the time. And, <laughs> sorry, the main differences between calls and songs is the time of year. So, they're all going off now. I'm going to have to talk louder. So alarm and contact calls happen all year round, whereas songs are mainly in the breeding season and they're used to defend territory and to find mates that mainly occur. And those mainly occur in the breeding season. So you'll hear blackbirds singing, robins singing. So if we wait for Valentine's Day, that's when the birds usually start singing to defend their territories and attract uh, the males to attract the females. Uh, but they will be issuing alarm and contact calls and flight calls all year round. So here's a summary of what we've covered so far. Four to start with, taxonomy, that's all about families and even better, a genus if you can get it to genus. Where you are in the world, location, what sort of place you're in, the habitat, and when you're there, season. So the lazy Hampshire stringer. Two more, loves dude, lighting and distance. And we talked about well-lit birds, dull-lit birds, and distance near, far, etc. And then finally, two more. Behavior, jizz, the way it moves, it flicks its wings, it runs up and down trees, and most importantly, how it sounds, how it calls, what noises it makes. And that's it. And we'll pick up the rest tomorrow night. So I'm going to pass back to, to Barry. Um, and thank you very much, everybody, for, for listening. Um, there we are. Done. Ian, thanks. Thanks very much. That, that's great. Um, spot on time. Uh, we're just, uh, just short of the hour. <laughs> yeah, see if there's any, any questions tonight. Um, I'll pause as I normally do, just in case there are any questions we can fire off. Um, alternatively, by all means, do post them via email back to Nicola and we'll get them responded. I know one or two people did post questions in advance of tonight, uh, which Ian was uh, gracious yep. enough to respond to in some detail. So thanks for doing that, Ian. Um, and we can always carry them forward to tomorrow night as well. Um, 
So nothing's come through, Ian. So I think you obviously covered it in sufficient detail. Oh, detail. Obviously, one or two thanks coming in. <laughs> well, well done, Ian. Phew. Um, there you go. Well done, sir. So part one over. Um, we return tomorrow night. Hopefully, yep. uh, most of you joining us. Um, Ian, thanks for tonight's session. Uh, thanks for everyone for uh, joining us tonight. And uh, all being well, we'll uh, see uh, most, if not all of you, tomorrow night as well. So same time, same place, as they say. And uh, we look forward to uh, continuing the 12, Ian. So we go 9 through to 12 tomorrow evening. So, uh, Correct. Uh, yep, that's great. I wish everyone... All right. Good night, everyone, and thanks for listening. Thanks Good all. Good evening now. Bye. All right. Thanks, Ian. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Good night, all.